Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. I'm Mackenzie Eaglin. Welcome to the American Enterprise Institute. And thanks for coming out this morning for our viewers here in the room and live online to join us for another conversation with the Commandant of the Marine Corps, General James Amos. Now, I know he needs no introduction because he's returning back here to AEI from his conversation. He kicked off our series with the Joint Chiefs, and we are always eternally grateful to him. And I told his staff, now that he's returned, I'm going to pressure all of his colleagues to do the same and return back to AEI and have a follow-up conversation. So you already know that he's the Commandant. He's been so for about three and a half years. Uh, he's nearing not quite the end of his, his tenure, but I know he's thinking a lot about his legacy and what he wants to leave behind. Uh, in the next six months and his top priorities for the Marine Corps, which uh, he will be talking about this morning. Of course, the Commandant has held command at all levels. He's pretty much had every amazing job that you can possibly think uh, in war and peace. Just a quick administrative note before I turn over the, the microphone. We will be handing out question cards before, during, and after General Amos's remarks. So if you can write them down and hand them to somebody who looks like they'll take them from you, or just give them to me. Uh, we will also be, I will be fielding those questions for you up here on stage. We'll be taking questions from Twitter and, and Facebook and elsewhere as well. We're really grateful here at AEI that, this, that the Commandant has returned and in one of his final think tank appearances uh, in this position. And I'd like to thank you for everything that you've done and all of your time in service, not just this latest tenure in Washington. I'm going to stop talking because I want to get started on the conversation. Thanks for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Um, I do enjoy coming back here, and thanks, uh, Mackenzie, for the uh, the invitation. I, I was looking back my records, and the last time I was here, it was Valentine's Day, and I guess it worked out okay. It wasn't kind of a massacre or anything like that, so I think I got the invitation back. But I think, you know, the last time I was here, uh, we had just finished testifying, the chairman, myself, uh, uh, the other service chiefs, uh, along with uh, uh, the Comptroller of OSD, Bob Hale, uh, Dr. Ash Carter, or the Deputy Secretary of Defense. We'd all just gotten done testifying on the matter of sequestration. None of us quite knew how it was going to go, but we had our, our spider senses were up, and uh, quite honestly, our instincts, uh, having worked in these kinds of things along with Congress for decades, telling us that it's here. Uh, we didn't like it, but ladies and gentlemen, I'll tell you, it is here. It's among us. Uh, we have a bit of a reprieve in 14 and 15, as you know. We're about half sequestered. Um, we're grateful for that. Uh, but FY16 and beyond is, is still uh, a fully sequestered budget. So that's, that's a matter that's yet to be resolved. And that will have an impact. It will have an impact on modernization. It will have an impact on readiness of all the services, not just mine, but all the services. So that has not been resolved yet. And that's... Uh, that's something that we're going to need a lot of help with with Congress uh, as we build the 16 budget, which we're doing right now, by the way. We've had a lot of developments uh, since uh, last year, so I thought what I'd do is I'd talk a little bit about my position or my thoughts on a couple of these things regards uh, as it relates to being a member of the Joint Chiefs, um, and then I'll kind of narrow it down to being a, a service chief. First, let me uh, make a comment that I think our nation it is a critical juncture uh, in history. Uh, I call it a strategic inflection point. Others have as well. After 12 years of war and uh, we're pulling our forces out of Afghanistan, we're resetting our military. We're strategically reposturing the Pacific. We've come to have a greater appreciation for Europe uh, and the African continent right now. It's not that we didn't before, but I think the reality that uh, how critical they are has, uh, has nested and settled in with us as well. So all this is going on while the budgets are going down, going down as much as 30 to 32 percent. So I think that's from the high. So I think that's a significant uh, uh, point in time that we have not seen in a long, long time. So we're wrestling with the uglier side, all of this, by the way, we're wrestling with the uglier side of, of things that are happening around the world in the human domain in places like Iraq and Syria in uh, Nigeria and a few other places. Throughout the world, we're seeing increased competition for uh, uh, resources, prevalence and severity of natural res uh, disasters, all kinds of political and social unrest, cyber attacks, violent extremism, human trafficking. Now, I, I watch this, and this is, this is important because I'm about to make a statement here in a minute. Uh, 
that, that, I, you know, that I've made many, many times in public. I've testified to this before. And all of this is going on um, against the backdrop that I just described. And that leads me to the conclusion that there will be no peace dividend uh, after uh, we come out of Afghanistan. Now, the Marine Corps will be out for the most part uh, by the end of this year out of Afghanistan. I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, that are appropriate uh, in the question and answer. But we're effectively going to be out of Afghanistan. So, and I think our nation, and I think Congress and the American people, and I think probably rightfully so, this isn't a criticism, they expect a peace dividend. And I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think there is going to be a peace dividend. I think the world is going to, is going to refocus our resources and our assets uh, elsewhere. Um, and so uh, I come to the conclusion that, that we're not going to do less with less, uh, which, is, which is kind of a, a popular uh, perspective today. We're going to do the same with less. And I'd argue the way the world is beginning to unfold, we may very well be doing more with less. You've heard me say it again and again uh, that uh, all these things, uh, this these entanglements, all these things kind of define the new normal. And while we may be done with them, we may like to think we're done with them, we may want as a nation to be done with them, they're not likely done with us. Both here in the Beltway and across the nation, there's a dialogue uh, across our country, and I think it's healthy. But what should we do with the military? What, I mean, how much engagement uh, is, is, is uh, enough? Uh, after 12 years of war, there's many across our nation that believe it's time to furl the flag and come home. And I do understand that. I understand that sentiment, and I understand the fatigue uh, of combat fatigue, the 13 years of longest war our nation's ever been in that, that, uh, that energizes that. While the wariness of foreign entanglements is a healthy American instinct, in some ways it's almost an American pastime, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we can afford to disengage from the world. Quite honestly, in many ways, in critical areas all around the world, the United States has the only ability and the only will to lead the world through some of its thorniest challenges. Given the realities of our budget challenges and the matter of priorities, excuse me, the matter of priorities then takes center stage. Where do we engage and how much? I believe the United States must retain a global presence that deters aggression underwrites a stable economy. I think that's critical. A stable economy around the world, globally, and builds trust among our allies and our partners. Part of building that trust centers on, on this matter of forward presence. Forward presence, there's a cost. There's a cost to manpower, there's a cost to equipment, and there's just a, a, a the flat cost of, uh, of dollars. But it costs. Forward presence allows us to build strategic relationships that truly matter when the chips are down, when time is short, and when lives are on the line. We saw that last fall, just around Christmas, with that super typhoon that went through the Philippines. We saw it again over Christmas with the, uh, with the matters in South Sudan. That went through Christmas and into January and February, and I'd argue today, ladies and gentlemen, it's not been resolved in South Sudan. And we saw it again just recently as as our ships moved up, the USS Bataan, part of our large deck amphibious fleet, pulled off the coast of Libya, not knowing exactly how that's going to play out. Uh, and just this last week, the, uh, the, the aircraft carrier uh, moved up into the North Arabian Gulf along with the amphibious ready group and the USS Mesa Verde loaded with Marines and assets. So forward presence counts. In fact, it's our nation's insurance policy. I liken it to that insurance. You buy insurance because you don't know what's going to happen, whether it be car or health or home insurance. Uh, you buy that as a hedge against uncertainty. And I'd argue that the Navy and Marine Corps team provides a, uh, that, uh, that, uh, a solution to that uncertainty in a very unpredictable world. The Navy and Marine Corps team provides power projection from the sea, responding immediately to a crisis when success is measured in hours, not days. When trouble brews, and Navy expeditionary forces provide our leaders options. They provide a rapid response capabilities and the decision space to make wise choices, even under murky circumstances. And I would argue in today's environment, there are a lot of things that are not crystal clear. 
there are some murky uh, situations that are out there right now where it's just not clear what the next step is. Doesn't mean you're not planning for it. Doesn't mean you're not, you've not fought through these things and again and again, uh, and that we have the, intel the uh, intellect and the wherewithal to plan for them. But, but the solution is not exactly clear. Well, I'd argue that the Naval Expeditionary Forces buy that decision space. They provide the, our National Command Authority, our President, and our senior leadership the decision space to be able to go, okay, everybody take a deep breath. Let's see what, let's see what the next best thing uh, to do is. We did that just recently, not only with the amphibious ships, but we just put a, a FAST platoon, a fleet anti-terrorism uh, team into the American Embassy in Baghdad. 54 young Marines and one Marine captain. They were in there to reinforce the embassy. That's what we do. I don't know how events in Iraq and Syria are eventually going to play out. I'm not sure that any of us completely know at this point. But I do know this, that, that our forces, our naval forces, and in my service, the United States Marines, uh, are ready to answer the nation's call. We're ready, and that's, that's what we do for a living. We're America's crisis response force and we're prepared to, to uh, respond on a moment's notice. Let me just talk briefly about Afghanistan. Uh, your Marines are coming out of Afghanistan, I think, probably just about as well as we possibly uh, could have. Last year when I was here, we had a little over 7,000 Marines and sailors on the ground. A lot of coalition forces, our British partners, our Jordanian partners, our Georgian partners, uh, they're all there with us uh, in the Helmet and the Nimrod's province. So a little over our piece of it was 7,000. Well, today, ladies and gentlemen, we sit uh, below 4,000, and we're on our way down to, uh, to the end of December, where the number will relatively be speaking, because the, the actual force, what's inside the President's announcement of the 9,800 uh, U.S. forces on the ground has not been resolved. We're not sure what make, uh, will, that, what will make up precisely that 9,800. So, I'm going on the assumption right now that the clear bulk of the U.S. Marine Forces in Helmand and Nimroz will be out by the end of December. Uh, as far as the mission goes, I'll tell you, I feel uh, pretty good about it. You know, we, much like the Anbar province, uh, we took an area of Afghanistan that was pretty um, um, locked in turmoil. Uh, heavy drug trade along the uh, Helmand River Valley, you're aware of that, with the poppy. Uh, we took an area that was uh, kind of home to the Taliban, and we've been there now for about four or five years. And I'd argue that we've done, we've completed our mission. We will have completed it by the end of this year. Now, is it perfect? No, it's not. Uh, but I will tell you that the Iraqi national, excuse me, the Afghan National Security Forces, uh, the provincial governor uh, there, the, Af the provincial uh, police chief in the Helmand province, uh, their hearts are in the right spot. The Afghan National Army Forces, the 215th Corps, are trained and battle-hardened, and they have assumed the battle space as we pulled out, moved forces out of Afghanistan, and moved forces back and closed down combat outposts. So I think, in many ways, um, we have done what we set out to do. We've restored uh, a reasonable uh, level of peace. Markets are open. Uh, schools are in session. District governorships are, uh, are busy doing the business of, of their districts. They're, uh, they, they're the, think along the lines of a mayor. Uh, and I think we've done uh, what we said, set out to do. As far as the region uh, is concerned, I think that <clears throat> we are prepared for the first time to have a democratic turnover and a peaceful democratic transfer of power. Now, I know my good friend Joe Dumford, I talked to him on Sunday, uh, has his hands full at the moment. Lots going on. You read the same press I do. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, we need to look back on this, these elections and think uh, what, what has really happened. We've just gone through a runoff that, uh, that had just earlier this month that had a higher turnout than the general election did just a mere couple of months before, a higher turnout in our province of our females, and it was reasonably peaceful. So I, I think you have to put that in perspective, and I think we ought to look back on that and feel good about that. The issues of voter fraud will be resolved inside, inside of Afghanistan. They'll work their way through that. So ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that I think the, as I look back on this now, and this has not come without, without a cost, uh, two o'clock this morning, 
uh, about 11 of us were on the ramp at Dover uh, receiving our three fallen uh, angels back. So there is a cost, and I'm very, very mindful of that. Uh, but, but I will tell you that it is a coalition force writ large as a uh, U.S. force and then the Afghan forces together. I think we've made a difference, and I'm personally proud of that, and I feel good about all that we've done uh, as we move forward. And after a decade of war and this, this, this really human conflict, this, this uh, 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 the, the man against man, uh, and that's not a, it's not a sexist comment. You know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the brutal crucible of uh, hand-to-hand -hand combat and facing combat, uh, that arena, uh, it, we've, we've, all our forces have excelled. Today, in spite of that, as we come out, we're resetting the Marine Corps. We're resetting it physically, mentally, and, and morally. One of the most visible changes uh, of our Corps as we come out and we reset, not only to the Pacific, and I'd argue that, that we are already there, uh, we've, we've achieved General Post, Secretary Panetta's 22,500 Marines west of the International Date Line. We are there. Uh, but as we rebalance the Corps, uh, equipment-wise, people-wise, training-wise, um, uh, we, are, we are resetting uh, our ground equipment. And probably no greater example of that is the recent decisions that that we've made as an institution that I've made as a common on replacing the amphibious combat vehicle or amphibious assault vehicle or 50 plus or 40 plus year old vehicle. Replacing that vehicle is, uh, is my number one priority. I've come to understand in this position as a service chief, uh, if everything is a priority, uh, then, then you get nothing. Everything, uh, everything competes. But so you have to narrow your focus. This is my number one operational uh, priority and it will remain the procurement priority will remain that way during the remainder of my tenure as the Commandant. Nearly two decades ago, the Marine Corps unveiled the groundbreaking concepts of operational maneuver from the sea and ship to objective maneuver. Those great concepts uh, remain uh, solid today. We talk about coming from a sh offshore in a sea base, an assemblage of ships and Marines uh, assembling there, perhaps even our coalition partners down the road. Uh, coming from, from the sea. Since then, we've endeavored to field uh, capabilities within the Marine Corps and the Navy team to realize the full potential of these concepts. But here's the rub. The proliferation of anti-access and aerial denial weapons, which has been a lot of discussion about that in the last five years, uh, demand a greater standoff out to sea and a greater survivability once you are ashore. This coupled with declining fiscal resources led us to make some significant decisions regarding our overarching vehicle strategy. Our intent from the beginning was to replace our 40 plus year old amphibious assault tractors with a fleet of modern track vehicles that would have the speed and the lethality and the protection necessary to meet tomorrow's threats. Well, given the forecast future, our concept called for the initial elements of a future amphibious assault to be launched well out to sea to allow for sufficient engagement for anti-ship cruise missiles. Two and a half decades ago, 25 miles seemed sufficiently far enough out to sea. And it was initially believed that that would be satisfactory, so we began a program called the Expeditionary Fighting Vehicle, which we thought would accommodate 25 miles out at sea. Ladies and gentlemen, that assumption simply is not true today. Due to the development and proliferation of, uh, of integrated anti-access and aerial denial weapons and capabilities, both today's and tomorrow's contested threat environments require an operational standoff distance much greater, much greater than had been previously considered. While the Marine Corps worked to develop this capability, neither industry nor our development teams could ultimately achieve an affordable vehicle that met the requirements. We can build a vehicle that will go 28 knots. We can build a vehicle that has tracks on it. We know how to do that. We did that uh, a decade ago. But it's not affordable and it does not meet the requirements for today and for tomorrow as it relates to mission and threat. While we focused on the technology and the mechanics of the tracked high-speed vehicle concept, meanwhile, in the background, kind of unbeknown to us, industry, 
continue to make great strides in wheel vehicle maneuverability and protection. Recognizing this, we altered our view and opened our aperture to see if there are other alternative solutions. These technological advancements, coupled with the realities of the A2AD environment, uh, threat environment, and the extreme budget cuts of sequestration led us in a completely different direction. The harsh realities of budgetary restrictions necessitated a complete reassessment of our ground tactical vehicle strategy. We are not alone in that, as you know. Several of my sister services are doing exactly the same thing. As well as the capabilities of the Navy's future surface connectors. We have gone back now with the Navy. Admiral Greener and I are joined at the hip regarding connectors and we're moving forward with new energy as it relates to the matter of connectors. Putting vehicles on something and then and having that be able to continue at high speed from, from 100 miles off the coast. I've leaned heavily on the analysis and feedback from many working groups, both made up of active duty and civilian and our industry partners. Uh, we've approached this thing from just about every angle you can possibly do. I spent the last three and a half years as the Commandant, two and a half years as the Assistant Commandant, and two years as the Head of Requirements uh, looking at this problem. So this is not something that I've taken lightly. It's not something that I've not studied considerably. Our senior retired and active duty leadership, some with differing, differing opinions of correct replacement of a uh, specific kind of vehicle, have uniformly agreed with our analysis that the factors that we talked about and I described well are in fact reality and they need to be contended with. You cannot ignore them. With their recommendations in mind, we will execute a phased approach to replace the AEV with the amphibious combat vehicle. The first phase of this approach we call ACV 1.1 incorporates procurement of a commercial off-the-shelf um, wheeled amphibious combat vehicle. Commercial off-the-shelf. There are at least four manufacturers, ladies and gentlemen, that are building vehicles of this type. Uh, I've ridden in all four of them. Uh, and because this is a COT solution, and because it's, it's, we, it will provide near term, uh, uh, an element of near term solution, uh, I think we're, we're going to move on in that direction. And we're going to rapidly, uh, uh, relatively speaking, rapidly be able to field this. This shift from high water speed and a track solution is not the result simply of a single issue, but rather a combination of tactical threat, operational, technical, and budgetary components that all highlight the reasons for our choice of action. We can choose to ignore that, I and mean, we can try to live in decades of uh, two or three years ago, I mean two or three decades ago, and I do understand that. That's a comfort zone. But, but when you're dealing with the money we're dealing with and the threat that we're dealing with, I cannot ignore it as a service chief. While the decision to proceed with a wheel platform may seem like a paradigm shift, it's absolutely not. We will still maneuver from the sea base, we'll still maneuver from the sea, uh, and we will have the high-speed connector capability that will be able to do that. But it will also incorporate the hard lessons learned in Iraq and Afghanistan. Ladies and gentlemen, Congress, the American people, the mothers and fathers, who loan me their sons and daughters, expect me to put them in vehicles that will protect them. No longer do they want me to be in a soft-sided Humvee or, or something that's got a level of protection that, uh, that even a modest IED or a threat will be able to penetrate. They do not want that, they don't expect that, and they will not tolerate it, and neither will I. So those are lessons we've learned. The other thing I'll tell you is this vehicle will spend 90 plus percent of its time on land. 90% of its time on land. If we had this vehicle today, if we had it today and something were to happen and we had to go, okay, don't misquote me here, if we had to go into Iraq, I wouldn't take the AAV into Iraq. I'd take the ACV into Iraq because it's got a level of protection that, uh, that's commensurate with, the, uh, with our MRAPs. And you think about that. And it's got a maneuverability that's even greater. So if I had it today, that's what I would do. We can't ignore the reality of the threat today. Understanding the choices we're making now will last for decades. I want everybody in the audience to know that I'm taking this very, very seriously. And we can't afford to get it wrong. And I'm confident that we are not. So as we physically reset the Marine Corps equipment-wise and kind of position across and around the world, um, we're ded rededicating ourselves to uh, some fundamental things that I call the soul of the core. Uh, to kind of put it in almost in a spiritual contest, 
context. That's, that's the matter of the, our values of honor, courage, and commitment. Many years ago, General Krulak in the late 90s gave all Marines a little, looked like the shape of a credit card. And it had our values on it, honor, courage, and commitment on the backside that defined it. Well, those, those have stood the test of time for almost 239 years for our Corps. So as we come out now, we have, we have an opportunity as we bring Marines back and not only take care of equipment and all that and, and reorient around the world, we're also going back to the fundamental basics of honor, courage, and commitment. We're dedicating ourselves, rededicating ourselves, kind of recommitting ourselves to those fundamental principles that caused, that, that really enabled the Marines to plow through the wheat fields in 1918 in Bella Wood into the machine guns. We were just there in March of this year to honor our dead. Uh, thousands of Marines lost their lives, but they blunted the attack on Paris, 60 miles east of Paris, with the 5th and 6th Marine Regiment. So what caused them to willfully, by the way, the majority of them had no combat experience, none. What was it that caused them to, to charge straight ahead in, uh, in the face of withering machine guns uh, at, the very, at the very pointy end of the German advance on Paris? Well, it was discipline, and it was standards, and it was adherence to those standards, and it was leadership, and it was they were told, they were expected what to do, they were told what to do, and they were held accountable for that. Well, that's the same thing that, that caused the Marines to be so uh, overwhelmingly strong on the very first offensive in the Pacific at Guadalcanal on August the 7th, 1942, when they landed there, exactly the same. Those Marines, there was probably not 3% of them that had any combat experience. Same thing in Marja, Sangin, Kajaki, Fallujah, Ramadi, it's the same thing. So these are timeless attributes that the Marine Corps is going back to, and I point them out to you because I think they're important to the soul of the Marine Corps. Persistent discipline, faithful obedience to orders, strict adherence to standards, and concerned and engaged leadership. Lastly, I take a moment to mention uh, some matters on Marines. So let me put my Marine hat on for just a second. First, I'd like to remember uh, Lieutenant General Ernie Cheatham in this audience today and those that are watching it uh, live somewhere uh, around Washington. Uh, some of you may know Ernie Cheatham. Uh, we'll re lay him to rest tomorrow. Ernie Cheatham was a larger-than-life figure in the Corps, a great bear of a man, one of the oldest former professional football players who left the NFL to join the Marine Corps during Vietnam. And he served the Corps as an officer, and he was the hero of the Battle of Way City in the Tet Offensive in 1968. He was the embodiment of the institutional values that I just spoke of. We lost a living legend last week, and I just wanted to publicly, in front of everybody, honor his service to our nation. Secondly, I had the honor last Thursday, and then again on Friday, to be at the White House and then our backyard at 8th and I for a parade when President Obama awarded the Medal of Honor to Corporal Kyle Carpenter for shielding a fellow Marine from a grenade blast in Afghanistan in 2010. Kyle is a remarkable young man, a true testament to resilience and uh, an ability to overcome. The Taliban grenade cost him an eye, most of his lower jaw, just about all of his teeth, collapsed his lung, man mangled his hand, uh, but could not destroy his spirit. With all the news of Iraq and everything else that's going on around on the press today, uh, I don't feel that the story of his heroism, quite frankly, got the attention that it deserved last week. So I'd encourage you to check out his story, go to the Marines, uh, Mil uh, Marines website, He's one of my personal heroes and a fine young man. So, Mackenzie, with that, what I'd like to do is just open it up to questions. And uh, there's no shortage of things happening around the world, so I anticipate the questions will probably be pretty frisky. Thank you. Thank you, sir, so much for your remarks and for being here. I, it, it was an appropriate note that you ended on, and, uh, and the theme of, I think, your remarks, not just your priority in, in, in your uh, remaining months here, but really, I think, uh, 
you mentioned the very real conflict that many Marines have been in the last decade plus, almost in a half now. And you mentioned your trip to Dover. You concluded with uh, some heroes that have recently been lost, young and old. And I was hoping that we could start out talking about not not names or anything specific, but if you if you could fill us in on the three fallen Marines that you welcomed home this morning and what what were they doing, and so that the rest of us can appreciate, we already owe them a debt of gratitude. But I would like to know who they were and what they were doing, maybe not by name. I'll be happy to. Uh, they were all members of the uh, Second Combat Engineer Battalion from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. A staff sergeant with multiple combat tours. Um, just a phenomenal family. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to imagine that you're looking at a uh, a wife, a mommy, uh, with two wonderful children. One that's still in a stroller, and uh, and a two and a half year old beautiful daughter in her arms last night or early this morning. And she is as poised and as uh, I guess. I guess as together as you possibly could be under these circumstances. The young Lance Corporal, uh, both two Lance Corporals, neither one of them were married, uh, come from great families. Uh, they were all in doing a what we call a route clearance mission. And uh, if you, if, as we pulled out of, you know, at one point we had, I think, 175 combat outposts or, or forward operating bases all through Helmet. We're down to uh, basically at one. Um, uh, in addition to the one we, we're all living at right now at Camp Leatherneck and Bastion. So we've closed all these down. We've sent Marines home, sent equipment home as we've kind of pulled back. Uh, but we still patrol. We patrol around Camp Leatherneck to keep the enemy pushed away. There's no question that the Taliban uh, will continue to probe and look for opportunities. So they were out on, on a, what we call a route clearance mine. They were in a one of our very, very large uh, MRAPs and it had a mine roller on it. And, uh, and it went over an IED uh, that was uh, command wire detonated, which means it wasn't a pressure plate, it wasn't any of that. And, uh, and it went off a huge uh, amount of homemade explosives underneath the vehicle. And it took the life of the uh, staff sergeant, the driver, and the young lance corporal who was in the turret. So that's the loss that we've just had. Uh, it took the wind out of us. It's been a while since we've lost a Marine. Um, it's been at least uh, about five months, almost six months now. So it, <clears throat> it was a rude awakening. And, it, and it, not that we needed a wake-up call, <clears throat> because we're very careful, uh, understanding that the enemy, um, those, those that remain, uh, as we come down in size, will their opportunities to interdict us will be fewer and fewer, and therefore they become more desperate. But these are great young men uh, that served our country. Their moms and dads were there. Um, and uh, I think the consistent theme from all, all three families was their son, uh, or in the case of our staff sergeant, uh, her husband, uh, uh, died doing what they believed in. They died being a United States Marine and believing in what they did, and they were part of the team. So thank you for asking. Well, God bless their families, and thank you for talking about it. It is it is too easy to sit in Washington and forget that that is happening every day for all of the services. Uh, not to not to get too overly um, up close and personal, but I did want to reference, you know, as uh, as you become a commandant in retirement, you also you get to speak freely. Not that you don't now, sir, but your <laughs> your successor, or excuse me, your predecessor, one of them. General Conway recently spoke, and he spoke from the heart, and I was struck by his comments. They have stuck with me ever since at my former employer at the Heritage Foundation, and he, you know, he's watching the news in Iraq. I mean, you've described a lot of places that are that are uh, at risk or falling apart in some cases, my description, not yours. General Conway described, I think, or possibly stated what I think a lot of Marines must think who have served in the last decade and a half, and he said, we fought and died taking those cities, Fallujah, Ramadi, et cetera, and to watch them fall, I'm sure it's very, very difficult. It's very disappointing. What do you say when you're out there talking to Marines who might publicly or privately express the same sentiment that General Conway did? You know, uh, it's not just the Marines uh, that are currently serve. It's those that have served. Uh, we were... Um, with a bunch of them, this this 
past week, uh, wounded Marines from Iraq. Um, it's those and it's the families of those that we've lost, our Gold Star families. So it's it, it, the same emotions well up inside of all of us uh, that I think probably General Conway uh, shared. I didn't see his remarks, so I can't, I can't refer to them. But I know the man because he and our friends and I've served for him in Iraq twice. Um, so there is a, I mean, there's no question. It, it pulls at your hearts. Uh, and so I get asked this question a lot. And uh, the, the, the only way I can resolve it right now, because we don't know how history is going to turn out. We, we know how we, what we believe things are today. Only history is we look back, you know, uh, a decade or two decades or three decades from now will will really tell us what's really transpired. So I would argue that uh, that that history will be the will be the greatest judge of this. Uh, and, and right now, even it's even though it's tempting, uh, I'm trying to resist the temptation to be judgmental at this point. But I'll tell you, the Marines that that fought in in Iraq, 852 of them gave their lives, killed in action. 8,449 were wounded in combat in Iraq. So there, there is a cost to this. Uh, and the, the money cost, the equipment cost, while important, is irrelevant to me. Uh, it's the cost of, of, of the human life. And that's just us in the Anbar province. But when we left four years ago, five years ago now, it's, uh, we drove out, and I was there just shortly before we left. Um, I, I, you talked about feeling good about something. We felt good about it. You walked into places uh, like Ramadi and Fallujah, and I've got members of my staff sitting on the side who've got more time in Ramadi than, than, than he probably had with his family. Uh, during that three or four year period of time. We felt good about it and because the governance was there, the streets were clean, they were paved, street lights, markets were open, water, fresh water, schools were open, and on and on and on and on. So when we drove out four or five years ago, uh, we had absolutely completed our mission there. So that's the first thing I always go back to when I look at Marines and, and you know, put my arm around a wounded Marine uh, that's, you know, recovered and is out in, in life. And I look at him and say, you know, we, we did what we said we would do. We, we did what we were told to do. And just like Afghanistan, the Ambar province was a pretty frisky place. I mean, it was the seat of the Sunni Triangle. And, uh, and so when we left, we completed our mission. So we ought to all feel good about that, regardless of what, how this turns out. The second thing is, I tell everybody is, we sanctified the ground that we fought on with the blood of those Marines who lost their limbs and, and those that lost their lives. That ground was sanctified. Now, you can't take it away from us. You can't. History will never be able to look back and say, well, we should have, we could have, we, we, you know, not us. We left. We left. This is no bravado, but we completed our mission. So that's the solace that I take. I don't know how it's going to turn out, Mackenzie. Does it break my heart when I look at places like Al Qaim and Aditha and Useva and Ubaidi and, and Korean Village and Ramadi and Fallujah and you bet. But let's just see how history and how this turns out. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I often have talked about in the past um, upholding uh, that that we the proverbial we who, who aren't you and aren't in uniform and your colleagues and, and others and their families have not one but two contracts with our service members as a nation, as Americans. And we often think that it is not just to, to take care of service members and their families, everything from housing assistance and education and subsidized groceries, et cetera, and good paychecks. But uh, it's also that we don't want Marines or, or any service member in a fair fight. As Americans, we hate to do it, but if we have to send you in harm's way, that we want the enemy to die and you to live, the proverbial you. And so I've often called it two contracts. I think 
Pentagon leadership have started to call it quality of life and quality of service, and I, you know, the way I would describe those those two contracts. I suspect that's why the amphibious combat vehicle 1.1 and its follow-on capabilities are why that's such a top priority. I, I'm, ask, I'm putting words in your mouth and asking you to say if I'm right or wrong, but I'm sure many people in the audience say, well, why is he so focused on this equipment? And you mentioned that mothers and daughters and husbands and wives are loaning you their family members. And you, I, I suspect that you care so much about this piece of equipment because you care so much about getting people safely back. Am I, am I accurate in saying that? No, you absolutely are. You know, the, um, you measure survivability. Your survivability in, in vehicles really came, um, really came into its own around 2005. And uh, that's when we were losing. We'd, we'd upgraded the Humvee again and again and again. And I mean, I was, we were there, we watched what we call the Aggie armor put on the Humvee. We were welding uh, steel plates in, uh, in Iraq, uh, hanging them on doors to protect. And then, and then the MRAP, the Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicle became an opportunity in 2000, late 2005. And that set a whole new standard. Now, all of a sudden, Marine soldiers, sailors, and airmen uh, were, could withstand a, a blast for the most part and survive. And, my, and yeah, they, they had a heck of a headache. Uh, some were knocked out, but they didn't lose their legs. They didn't lose their lives. And that became, um, I think, the gold standard. I think the MRAP, when we start talking protection, for our sons and daughters. The MRAP has become the gold standard. Everything that, that we do as relates to vehicle procurement, they relate to the, they, Congress, the American people, relate the level of protection to MRAP. That's the reason why in my remarks I said MRAP level protection. The amphibious combat vehicle, the, the wheel vehicles that, that, that uh, and again, we haven't picked one, but there are, like I said, there are four manufacturers that are out there that have they're actually producing these. Uh, they have, uh, for the most part, a uh, level uh, of protection that an MRAP has, and, and, and perhaps even greater. So if you, if you just looked at that and you said, okay, that's, that's important, which it is, and then you looked at what we had been looking at, which is the high speed, flat bottom, very low to the ground, track vehicle because it was going to get up on a plane it was going to go 25 28 knots ladies and gentlemen that that uh, that vehicle had probably 25 percent of the protection that these vehicles are going to have that they already have today so why would i do that and i haven't even talked about maneuverability ashore i haven't even talked about the size of the engine and the compartment and the amount of cramp space and we're going to build a vehicle solely designed for high speed water which is where it'll spend maybe just a few percent of its time and the rest of its time it's going to be ashore and I'm going to ignore maneuverability ashore I'm going to ignore protection ashore I haven't even talked about reliability and maintainability yet in other words what we call O and S cost uh, the operations and sustainment cost of that vehicle I mean, these vehicles that we're talking about range somewhere between 1,000 to 1,200 hours mean time between failure. I mean, that's a lot of time. I mean, they're reliable. They're proven. And yet I'm going to put them in a vehicle that, that, that's going to break down at a, you know, a fraction of that all the time. So I just think I think the protection, I think the maneuverability, the, and by the way, I haven't even talked cost yet. We were headed towards a vehicle. And we've proven we can build it. We know we can do it. Uh, so that's not the issue. But that vehicle was going to cost at least three times as much. And I'm going to do that under a sequestered budget. Just It just didn't make sense. I haven't even talked about the threat yet. Okay? Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to move to questions from the audience. We have many piling up. And uh, this one is from, oh, she identified herself. Hope Hodgesek, I've worked with her. Marine Corps Times, I'm sure you know her already. So this one might be, it's along these same lines. Uh, you may feel like you've already answered the question. 
The Marine Corps Times recently published a critique in which retired colonels called the amphibious combat vehicle too heavy to accomplish long distance water crossings and transport Marines in armor via the Osprey, the V-22, instead uh, that transport them ashore. What is your response to this proposal? Has it been considered? Uh, you know, I don't, uh, I never mind uh, critical thought. And I think when you're, when you're, when you're, uh, when money is, is, is in strip, stiff competition, uh, uh, I think it's. I think you're absolutely. You're morally bound to have critical thought and spend time uh, thinking about this. Uh, I don't want to get in a, in a tit for tat on the article. I'll just tell you. I kind of go back to what I said earlier. You know, I I spent a little over two years as uh, Quantico's ahead of requirements, and I that's when I first uh, touched the amphibious. Excuse me, the expeditionary fighting vehicle, and I first touched the requirement for ship to shore uh, movement. Uh, uh, from an assault you know, from the sea base. So I, I watched that and nurtured the expeditionary fighting vehicle along for the two years there. Then I was the assistant commandant for 27 months. Uh, and when you're the assistant commandant, you're, you're kind of the chief operating officer. You're, the, you're, the, you're, help, you're working the budgets, you're working the programs for the commandant. So I was pretty familiar with that. So you think you just kind of add that up a little over four years of watching this thing. And then three and a half years as the commandant, a little over three and a half years. I, I think I have enough data. And and I ha what I have also is the threat. I mean, I, I have, we have as an institution, the analysis of the threat that's pushed these vehicles off. I mean, do I need to remind anybody that, that it wasn't too long ago, two, four or five years ago, that the Israelis almost had their frigates sunk by a simple UAV that flew out over the, uh, Medi the uh, Eastern Mediterranean and delivered a weapon, and it almost sunk the ship. And that is the simplest form of, of uh, anti-access. Uh, so imagine now, in a contested environment, the threat that would be out there. So I have that information. We have the information on cost. You can't, in today's environment, ignore that. You, I mean, it just you have to. Um, I have the, addition, uh, the additional information on maneuverability. I've gone out and I've actually watched uh, uh, the EFV maneuver um, out at Carson City, in Nevada, at the uh, uh, our National Te Automotive Test Center. Uh, I've watched the other vehicles maneuver. So I, so I actually have a fair amount of information here that, that I would argue uh, that um, needs to come to the light of day to cause one to realize that wow, I can. I can do this thing, I can spend a lot of money, I can buy a vehicle that, that the American people will not, ladies and gentlemen, will not allow me to send their sons and daughters in, in combat. They will not permit that to happen. Congress will not. And shame on me if I, if I even were to try. But so now I've got a vehicle that's optimized for one, one percentage of the range of military operations and the rest of it, um, which is where the vehicle is going to live. is. I, th I think those are things that, that need to come out in the discussion. They were not part of the discussion. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate. Um, so I, that's kind of where I am on this thing. I, I think we have, as an institution, um, probably a little bit more information than it was published in the article. And I, understand, uh, I understand the emotion about it. And I'm, not, I'm not offended by it. Uh, and I, like I said, I think critical thought and questions are, are, are welcome. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I can build a vehicle. By the way, um, the last time we did an opposed landing was 1951. Ladies and gentlemen, that's 63 years ago. Okay? Since we did that opposed landing in North Korea 63 years ago, the threat has changed uh, by an order of magnitude, by several orders of magnitude. The other thing we need to think about is, is, and I'm not saying we will never do that again. I'm, I'm never going to say that. But we're part of a joint force now. The weapon systems, the things that push uh, sea bases out to sea um, are so challenging that they are going to be solved by the integration of joint force capabilities. Those things are going to have to be beat down. 
before any amphibious salt comes ashore. The last thing I'd say is this. We want to be able to maneuver from a sea base that's now maybe 100 miles offshore. Now, how am I going to do that? I can pick the vehicle up with an MV-22 or a CH-53 kilo helicopter and, and, uh, and, uh, and sling it ashore. Or uh, I can swim it ashore from 100 miles, which would take uh, probably half a day. Marines, when they come out the back end of it ashore, would, would not be able to fight. Um, but what if I could put it on a high-speed connector that went 45 knots and could deliver five or ten of them at the time and could take them where the enemy is not and pull them maybe even up to the beach, maybe even a mile offshore and let them swim in in the amphibious camp. What if I could do that? Instead of taking the mountain to Muhammad, I'd like to take Muhammad to the mountain. And that's what this has done. The connectors are the solution set in this thing. Probably more than you want to know. Thank you. That's a passionate level of detail, which I appreciate here at the Think Tank. Along similar lines, uh, I, I was, I'm, I'm always behind on my news with very young kids at home. And uh, so I finally had the chance to catch up to 60 Minutes and watch their Joint Strike Fighter segment. And there was a remarkable Marine in there, uh, featured a pilot. I had the uh, an aviator. I have had the chance to, to meet him. Wow, is he one well spoken, well put together, brilliant pilot? He's a he's a remarkable person because he's flown the Air Force's F-22, their most advanced, our military's most advanced fighter jet, as well as the Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35. And it's amazing because he's a Marine, <laughs> and I think it's just a really really neat story. Uh, not necessarily asking about him specifically, but if you could speak to the F-35B program, its challenges and some of the drawbacks. There's been plenty of headlines. I won't get into each one of them, but the future of marine aviation, in, including the F-35B. The, you know, the uh, uh, first of all, uh, he is a very articulate uh, 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 CEO of the squadron, and, and uh, he's just a, he's just a heck of a fine uh, human being. On top of that. But he probably nobody was more uh, qualified to speak than he was because he was Air Force. He was on an exchange tour with the U.S. Air Force flying F-22. So he has seen the best that our nation can produce, and so he is qualified. Uh, whereas some of the rest of us that are just Hornet pilots are probably not. Um, the program right now, I think, is uh, probably about as healthy as it has been in the past. Uh, software continues to always be a challenge. Uh, just to give you an order of magnitude, the F-22 has two million lines of code and software. The uh, F-35 has six million lines, so three times as much. So when we began to develop this airplane, it's, they, they almost went out and hired every software guy and gal across America to come in and help them. That's actually progressed quite well. Uh, the, we're flying, we, as you know, we've stood up our operational squadron in uh, Yuma, Arizona a year ago. Uh, the squadron is fully stood up, uh, and they've been flying missions, uh, uh, flying training missions, excuse me, um, uh, as well as the training squadron in Eglin, as well as the test articles at Patuxent River, Maryland, and Edwards Air Force Base. So I, I, think, I think the jet, the software piece, is headed in the right direction. Uh, we believe we've solved the helmet, which was the integrated helmet with all the weapon systems and all the systems in the airplane. We believe that was an issue at one time. We believe we've solved that. Uh, there seems to be uh, kind of consensus that we're headed down the right path there. Uh, the structural bulkheads in the airplane and our version of the airplane are made out of aluminum. It's a main structural bulkhead. If you can imagine if the airplane's pointed this way, it's a bulkhead that goes this way. And, uh, and it's aluminum in ours because we want to keep the weight down. We found uh, it's, it's a structural airframe 496, and we found cracks in it. We, it's important to note that we found cracks in that in the dynamic testing at 9,000, I think, 800 hours, over 9,000 hours. And the airplane is a, uh, is a uh, uh, I think it's a 9,000-hour airplane, 8 or 9,000-hour airplane. In other words, past the service life of this airplane, the first crack appeared. So that's the first point that's important. Doesn't mean it doesn't need to be fixed. 
the uh, latest word I got, which was about a week ago, and I stay up with this very carefully, was that uh, they're confident they found the engineering fix on this thing. And uh, they'll be going back and we'll retrofit those airplanes. Most of our airplanes now are, are, are less than 1,000 hours of flight time. So, so we've got plenty of flying left to do before we have to go back and retrofit those. Uh, I think lot seven airplanes, are, uh, uh, as they come across the production line, will have the new bulkhead in them. So I think we're, I, I think we're doing okay. I think the testing, the increase in the envelope, an airplane has an envelope that flies in, not the kind you write a letter in, but, but one that's got defined by the aerodynamic limits of the airplane. Um, and you start off in the lower left-hand corner, and you start expanding that envelope to where you finally get it out to the maximum maneuverability of the airplane. Altitude, speed, G's, turn rate, and all that. And it's slowly getting out there. I think the program is doing well. We, we just had, you, you saw where they uh, had an engine fire on an F-35A. Uh, I, uh, I think it was at Edwards, uh, but, but an, F, an Air Force version. Yet to be seen what caused that. They'll figure it out. They're good at this. So I, th I think, I feel good about it. And the airplane will fit with us in the way. Imagine, today we sit off the coast of Libya with the USS Bataan. Now it's got AV-8 Harriers on it. And imagine if it had F-35Bs on it. What you could do, put it out in the Pacific and operate it in the Pacific in a, some type of contested environment. Landing in areas where you don't need a full runway. You just need a flat surface where you can come and land vertically. So I think it fits our expeditionary nature. Well, this is a different and unique question, so I, I appreciate it, and I'm going to just ask it. It's very broad, so you can take it any way you would like, any direction. Can you please talk about the U.S. Marine Corps and Coast Guard cooperation? U.S. Marine Corps? U.S. Marine Corps and what? And Coast, U.S. Coast Guard cooperation. Operations? Cooperation. Oh, cooperation. Oh, shoot. Well, we're, <clears throat> we're the only services that have a commandant in charge of them, so it starts right there. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and we have been, uh, in fact, I was honored to speak at Admiral Papp's retirement. So imagine a Marine uh, speaking on behalf of the Commandant of the Coast Guard as a retirement about three or four weeks ago. We're, we're, we're closely joined. I don't, I don't know that we're doing nautical operations together, uh, but if we need to, we would. But I think the communication, I think more important at this point, the two services are communicating well, and if there ever is a need to mutually support one another, we'd be happy to do that. Well, thank you. I, I didn't. I was so engrossed in our conversation, I got lost not staring at the clock, which is not my job, as I'm supposed to keep you on schedule, and I know you live by the same. So if you would all just join me in a heartfelt thank you and of appreciation to the conference. Thank you, everybody.